Welcome to the 40th Annual Housing California Conference. I want to start today by first thanking you all for making this the biggest, most exciting conference we've ever had. You may have heard we sold out, so thanks to all of you for being here. I believe this is a testament to the crucial moment in time. We have a state electorate that overwhelmingly supported California Proposition 1 and 2, bringing an investment of $6 billion into the state for affordable housing and homelessness. Woo! Thanks all of you. Woo! We have a new governor who's focusing on affordable housing and homelessness and so many legislators ready to just dive in. This is our moment in time. On behalf of Housing California, I think we are more than ready, and we want to thank all of you for being here today. I'm going to take this moment to call out a few different groups of folks. First of all, I'd like to thank our title sponsors, Union Bank and Chase. I'd also like to thank all of our gold, silver, bronze, and so many other sponsors. We have 107 folks. So grateful to all of you for making this happen. So thank you. I'm going to ask the Housing California Board of Directors to stand. This group of folks are phenomenal. Thank you so much for helping us lead us through all this critical work. And I'd like to invite the Housing California staff to stand. Woo! We are small but mighty. So grateful to this team. I'd also like to thank all of our vendors and the servers and other folks, each of you, for helping make this happen. So thank you for making this conference today work. So before I let you go and turn this over to so you can hear all the incredible speakers, I just want to note, as we kick off this conference and we kick off today, this is our opportunity to do business differently. We need to start to change the conversation, and it all starts today with all of you in this room. We want to achieve a California for all, a California where no one experiences homelessness and everyone has a safe, affordable place to call home in this beautiful, vibrant community. So I'm going to ask everyone to stop for a minute. Sit up tall in your chair, plant your feet firmly on the ground. Roll your shoulders back. Pause. Close your eyes if it's comfortable in your body. And then take a deep breath in. Bring your shoulders all the way to your ears and hold it. Open your mouth and sigh something out. <sighs> Again, deep breath in, shoulders to your ears, hold that breath in. Let it go. Ha. No, like really let it go. Let's try that one more time. Deep breath in, hold it at the top. Sip in a little bit more air. Open your mouth and let it go. Ha. 
Now keep your eyes closed. You've got 30 seconds more with me. I want you to take a moment and reflect on the notion that you have everything you need inside of you. You have the wisdom, you have the knowledge, you have the strength, the courage, and the power to accomplish anything and everything you dream of making happen. Now open your eyes and look around. Connect with each of the people who are here to support you on your individual journey and collectively support all of us. If you're comfortable, reach out and connect with that person. You knew this was coming. Reach out and connect with that person. Stand up. Stand up. Yes. Yes, you got this. Up. Woo! And now it is my honor and pleasure to introduce our title sponsor, Cecile. She has been a partner for Housing California, a partner in my heart, and is here to say a few words. Thank you, everyone. Have a great conference. Thank you, Lisa. And I think we will all agree that was pretty powerful, wasn't it? <laughs> Good job, Lisa. So first, obviously, on behalf of all of us in the room, happy birthday to Housing California. 40 years, 40 years. And I do want to thank, and, and Lisa didn't say that, but it's 2,200 people here today. That's a lot of people to connect with, by the way, so get ready. So hold on, guys. We're going to go to the interesting part. So you have to listen, even in the back. And I told Lisa earlier, yes, you can say silence, please. So here you go. It's my honor today to introduce the theme of the conference, which is shaping the future. And I do want to say, I know Lisa spent a lot of time deciding what to talk about this year. And I do want to commend Housing California, the staff, Lisa, and the board for, you know, after 40 years, there's a lot to be said about history and about achievements, but they have decided to really focus on our future and how we can do more and should not stop where we are because the challenges are there and clearly the opportunities are here. And we spend a lot of time talking about optimism. So that's clearly the theme for today. So I'd like to introduce the speakers today. Well, you're going to hear from Dr. Tiffany Manuel, from Dr. Nat Kendall, and our moderator, Chris Cole. So first, uh, you're going to hear again from Chris Cole, who is um, currently the director of the Homeless Initiatives for United Way of Greater Los Angeles. You probably know that, but what that means, he's in charge of Homes for Good, and he leads through this, the largest community-based effort in the nation um, to end homelessness. So, wow, Chris, that's small endeavor, right? <laughs> um, so Chris will set the context today for how narrative change and pay attention, that's the theme, right? Narrative change has been key to his work and why it is really important to us we start using it if we do want to reach our goals around housing and homelessness. Then, get ready for two of the premier experts in this country on the science of social change and especially as it pertains to affordable housing. So you're on for a treat, so please stop talking in the back. <laughs> this is important to all of us. It's not just this link, it's our future. And I want to emphasize what Lisa said, we have opportunities now, so please listen. This is helpful and useful to all of us. 
wow, that actually worked. Uh, <laughs> wow. No, seriously, it, there is a lot more to be done. We all know that here. We don't need to explain why. So these people are here to help us go to the next step. Um, draw, write down your questions. You know, the lunch program is not that long. But after that, we're lucky enough that the keynote speaker are staying. They will be in room, room 301 after lunch, and they will be willing to share, you know, to dive even deeper and answer all your questions. So please take advantage of that. And now, please welcome Chris Koch. Good morning, California. How are you all? Can we, before we start, can we actually get another hand for Lisa and the incredible team at Housing California? Our 40 years and the biggest conference so far. So I am the appetizer for an incredible two-course meal on this exciting subject of shaping the future, or to use another analogy, I am the local act to Jay-Z and Beyonce. Um, coming on board. So my name is Chris Coe. I have the distinct honor of being named after a cooking oil. Um, but as you've also heard, um, manage the homeless initiatives at the United Way, where we have a two-pronged approach to ending homelessness. Foundationally, we have this work of data and research, grant making and investment, as well as policy and pilots to, to do this work, which finds a public expression in communications, events, engagement, as well as advocacy and organizing. We started this work about 10 years ago with a pioneering investment from the Conrad and Hilton Foundation. And we started, this was during the days of opening doors, right? We started by creating an action plan of what it would look like to end homelessness. We formed a multi-sector coalition led by the business community and a partnership with the Chamber, Chamber of Commerce to, to launch this plan. We made the case that um, ending homelessness is possible, that homes end homelessness, and that doing something is cheaper than doing nothing. Then we rolled out, how do we deliver these precious resources, and how do we use the power of public funders and private philanthropy to architect the system together with local partners? How is that delivered in a community-based approach regionally through Leeds in Los Angeles County and an area as big as that? We celebrated the progress that we made together, and we showed that ending homelessness is possible through investments, that you don't attract homelessness. This is how you end it, by investing in change and investing in housing. We celebrated this progress annually through something called Homewalk. And so by the time ballot measures came around, and by the time it came um, to ask voters to invest in this with us, to put resources behind this, it felt like a natural evolution of our work. It felt like we've done this before, um, this is a conversation we've been ha ha having with people. But what I'll tell you is that we still had an incredible amount to learn. Because in this era of digital communications, sensationalized headlines, um, in this era of very short attention spans, we realized that communicating to 20 people at a time or even thousands of people at a time was very different than talking to millions of voters at a time. Thankfully, you know the end to this story. Uh, we were able to pass two historic ballot measures in Los Angeles, but we didn't want to take that result for granted. These are actual headlines from the last major time that Los Angeles made a major historic local investment in homelessness. And these are actual headlines to what happened as we tried to execute that plan. And we didn't want to repeat history. So what that meant for us is that taking what felt like art at times, if you're anything like me, we got into this work um, by avoiding science classes in college and uh, doing all the like. But that meant drilling down into some of what we've learned, right? So that looked like polling. It looked like this is not the practice that the new governor put a moratorium on. It is actually a place where focus groups take place, which sometimes have the same effect. But we were digging into what can we learn from this, and that expressed itself as we were putting this new campaign called Everyone In to continue the conversation with the millions of voters that we talked about. That's right, everyone in. So even in the name, we we're trying to take those lessons learned and incorporate it in them. But I want to give a few things as a tee up, as an example of the things we had to learn and relearn as we were 
uh, kicking off this initiative together. First thing, nonprofit developer, a term near and dear to us, something that might describe many of you in this room. When we talked to people about what they heard when we said nonprofit developer, here's what we found out. When we said nonprofit, they thought charitable people who don't exactly know what they're doing but have a good heart. And when they heard developer, somehow simultaneously, they also thought greedy, self-interested. So in the term nonprofit developer, simultaneously you had incompetent greed is what people were hearing. So instead of that, we've tried to use things like housing provider, builders, or even when we do use the word nonprofit developer, we try to be clear about what it does mean or doesn't mean. Another term that we've used even more than that, permanent supportive housing, near and dear to all of our hearts, at the core of the message that we had started. When we talked to people, we were trying to express the notion of permanence, a place where people could recover from, thrive, integrate back with community, and have the safety and security to do that. What people heard was institutionalization. They heard enabling, kind of a stuckness um, that we didn't expect. And so we have more and more as we've had public conversations, we talk about this now as supportive housing. Even when we use the acronym PSH, or even when we talk about it sometimes, again, we try to explain what it does or doesn't mean. Final example, storytelling, something that's proven incredibly effective. Uh, the Residents United Network, who are, where, where is Ron in the crowd? Where are you guys? Woo! You guys are our leading champions and the premier voice on this issue. We have a local amazing program in LA with CSH Speak Up Advocates that has been the core of our, yes, of our storytelling. And that had been, people will always be at the heart of our work um, and these events. But as we had them, we found out that as it, when we had only those speaking engagements, people missed some of the stories. And so as we've been having these storytelling events monthly now in Los Angeles, we're adding a couple pieces. This gentleman on the right, his name is Johnny Figueroa. He is the regional youth coordinator at an agency called Hovenes. He himself has lived experience, but he's actually telling the system story as a regional coordinator, previously as a case manager. We have other people there telling the story of what it's meant for them as a community member to work on this issue. So we're taking people, we're adding systems and strategies to really grow the message of what we're trying to do here. So you'll hear more about these principles at play with the toolbox, Dr. Nat Kendall Taylor, not only a national expert, a global expert on this issue, so I'm thrilled that you'll be hearing some of the principles at play that we've certainly learned a ton from on this work. But what we aim to do is not just communications, we aim to have conversations with people. And as we've built out our strategy, that's always been what we've tried to do. This is an example of when we're building out the coordinated entry system and this dreaded thing, the open mic. So when you try to build housing, our question was, how do we bring conversations even to the most polarizing of spaces? And so we've done the same approach of having open houses instead of open mics, where people are able to sit down. This is our city council president in what was one of the most contentious shelter siting battles at the end of it, where we were doing conversations and stations around the room instead of that. And so you've seen this progression. We've shared a little bit about the story. So this is when we started our work. You see the coalition going as we went to the second successful launch of Measure H. This was at the launch of Everyone In, where we grew that even more. These are images from Homewalk, um, which has grown to be the largest public event nationally. But what I'm excited for you all to hear from Dr. Tiffany Manuel is, what does this look like to have these conversations even more expansively? What does it look like to look at this issue citywide, statewide? How do you have this conversation broadly, but still in a very personal way? when you're talking about values that are important to all of us. So, if you've ever felt like this, if you felt alone on this path, I remember when we were doing this work and we found out there was a name to what we were doing. We found out about this thing called collective impact and backbone organizations. We're like, oh my gosh, there's a name to what we're doing. 
I hope you'll feel the same today. I know many of you have been engaged in this work even longer than a decade. For decades, you've faced these challenges. And I'm thrilled for you to hear from two amazing Sherpas to take you along the way. So Dr. Tiffany Manuel, uh, Dr. Nat Kendall Taylor, they will be uh, your guides on this journey, and I hope you'll learn with them today. So with that, I'll give over to Dr. Nat Kendall Taylor, CEO, President of the Research Think Tank Frameworks Institute. Hello, everyone, and good afternoon. Yeah, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna call that back. That was, that was too not there to even call it back. Um, I hope you all are doing well. Uh, Tiffany and I are, are super duper excited to get to be with you here today. As I looked over at Tiffany, I realized I don't know if she's super duper excited to be here. We haven't talked about it, but I think she is. Uh, it doesn't matter, though. We're gonna be okay because I am more than excited enough for the both of us, <laughs> Tiffany. We're gonna be good. Uh, so I just wanted to start with the, we're gonna kind of do a one-two combination here. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about framing and then Tiffany's gonna kind of take that and build it out like Chris said. But I wanna tell you, the, at least for my part of this, this session, the two goals that I have standing up here in front of you, and they both happen to start with the letter H, which is just kind of mildly cute coincidence and not some kind of framing trick that I'm, that I'm pulling on you. I never frame on friends. Um, In-laws all the time, but never on friends. So the, the first H is for helpful. I hope that I can take the work that, that I do at Frameworks, and I'll tell you a little bit more about what that is, and bring it to the work that you all do in this room, the really important work that you all do in this room, in a way that adds some value and some kind of positive uh, perspective to the work that you all are doing. So H, first H, helpful. Second H, humble. I am, uh, as you'll shortly see, not an expert in the work that you do, and I realize its, it's depth, its complexity, and its importance, and I, I, I humbly bring the work that I do to your work in, in the hopes that it can be helpful. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about myself, and, and that's not because I suffer from some overinflated uh, sense of self-importance and think that you care but rather that where I come from is important to the work that I'm gonna be talking to you all about. So I've already told you what I'm not. So I'm not a housing expert. Uh, I don't research housing. I, I'm not a, a builder or a developer, thank goodness. Uh, and I don't uh, work as an advocate on, on these issues. What I am is what's called a psychological anthropologist. And what that means is that I study culture and how it influences the way that people think. How people use culture to process information, to make meaning of messages, and very importantly, to formulate and reach their decisions on important social issues. And I think that the normal reaction when people hear that I'm an anthropologist is they feel really bad for me. <laughs> what, what horrible, horrible life decisions this gentleman has made. And I say to those people, I say, mom, dad, <laughs> anthropology is actually a really valuable real world discipline. And what I'm gonna try to do here today is show you, yeah, that's right, there's like four anthropologists in the room. Uh, that's more than, that's like three more than normal, that's good. Uh, I'm gonna show you what anthropology can do for you all in terms of making you more effective, more efficient, more powerful, more persuasive communicators in the work that you all do. And that's kind of one of my central arguments is that each and every one of you, while you may not identify as a communicator, you are a communicator on the issues that you work on. And so I do this work on, on culture and understanding with 30 other people who, who are kind of framing geeks and dweebs. And what we do is, is three different things. So first of all, we study deeply public thinking, public understanding on social justice issues. So we work, in addition to, to housing, we work on criminal justice and immigration and addiction and mental health and poverty. Uh, we also do a lot of work, which I'll talk about today, on the kind of the importance of how you communicate. Uh, the small choices, the large choices that you make as communicators and how those choices have an effect on what people think, feel, and are willing to do as a result. And for the first, so I've been doing that work for, for 12 years, the first, Eight of those years, that's all my organization did. We wrote 
wicked, unbelievably awesome 50-page research reports, and we gently placed them on the desks of on-the-ground organizers and advocates. And it took us seven years to realize that that did not for change make. Uh, and since then, we've been doing a lot more on technical assistance and training and actually supporting those people who are on the ground to do their work with our work more effectively and efficiently. And so I'm going to spend the rest of my time talking you through three reasons why the work that I do and others do on framing matters to the work that you all do on housing in California. And the first reason, which is kind of the fundamental principle, the core tenet of the science of communication, is that understanding is frame dependent. Now, I realize that's kind of gobbledygook academic ease. It sounds like something that someone with, with a PhD once said, and it is, in fact, something that someone with a PhD once said. And the way that I like to think about this a little bit more directly is what this means is that it is not just what you say that matters. Your content, your data is of consequence, it matters, but it's not it. And I'm gonna argue that of equal importance to what you have to say, your content is the choices that you make in how you say it. I'm not gonna ask you to take my word for this. I'm gonna give you three very quick, rapid examples that illustrate this point that the way that you say what you have to say matters. The first one, we're gonna go far afield from housing. It's gonna give you some productive distance. The first one is also gonna allow you to kind of look critically in on something that's not your own, and then I'm gonna take that away. I'm gonna give you an example from some of the work that we've done with Tiffany on housing that shows you just how important it is, kind of the, the choices that you make and how you communicate what you communicate. So the first example comes from work that my organization has done for a long time on early childhood development. I imagine that there are some folks in the room because of the, the really interesting and powerful overlap between parenting and early childhood development and housing have some familiarity with, with issues of early childhood. But we've done a lot of work on this concept of child mental health and how you take this concept and first of all make people believe that it exists and second of all, make people supportive of the policies and practices that are required to support it. So our job in this work are those two things. How you get people to see this as an important issue, what we call issue salience, and how you get people to support the kind of policies and practices that, that would improve this, uh, this situation for children and families. And in this particular example, I'm gonna show you two different values messages. So I don't know if you can see those of you in the back along the horizontal axis, along the bottom of the screen, and I'll walk you through it. If you can't see it, it's okay, are two of the values that we tested. So this is a large experiment. This is about 6,000 people just over. I'm going to call it 6,000 just for ease of presentation. And the way that this works is that each of these 6,000 people gets randomly assigned to hear one of these messages with the values that are listed along the bottom of the screen. So, Lisa, you log on, you get randomly assigned to hear the value of future progress, social prosperity. You would read a message that's formulated to look like a newspaper article, it's got a headline, some body text and a pullout, and it basically makes the argument that we need to do a better job on child mental health because, and we don't say it in such a cliched way in the experiment, children are our future, right? Our ability to progress, our ability uh, to have prosperity as a country depends on solid, stable child mental health and development. Nor you, you log on and you get the value of vulnerability. You would read something, same basic message except the beginning, the frame, is different. So you would read that it's important that we do a better job on this issue because children are our most vulnerable citizens. They deserve our empathy, our compassion, and then we must, we must do better. Chris, you log on, you get nothing. You're the control condition. You're the thin black zero line, sorry to say, uh, on the graph here. And so then we ask all of you the same questions that are designed to measure, again, how important you think the issue is and your support for these evidence-based policies. So what you're gonna see on the next click here are what I think are two gorgeous 
green bars are going to appear on the screen. And what those bars are going to show you is the extent to which hearing those different messages affects people's salience and issue support. So this is normally, I don't do this in rooms this big, where I ask for a drum roll. Can we do that? Good. Yeah, that's loud. So I don't know the, the statistical acumen of this group, so I'm going to give you a super duper important stats lesson right now. Up is good, <laughs> and down is not so good. So you should see these two gorgeous green bars and notice two things. So that value of future progress social prosperity is making people think the issue is more important and it's increasing the degree to which they support the policies. That is good news when we do these kind of experiments. We have a little framing dance that we do when we get those results, which I'm not going to do right now. But you also don't, don't, don't. You also probably notice this other green bar as your eyes wander to the right-hand side of the screen, which is the value of vulnerability, which is having a negative effect on people's perception of the salience of the issue and lowering their support for policies. So let me translate that for you. If you're an expert or an advocate working on this issue in the United States and you use the value of vulnerability, you not only waste your breath, but you make people less willing to support the very things for which you advocate. So I'll ask you for a second just to think if there are any parallels in the work that you all do, but I will say that in another piece of analysis where we looked at all of the field's communications over a three-year period, guess which value was used? in over 90% of those materials, right? Thank you all for making that not a rhetorical question, right? Vulnerability. So here we're starting to see that frames matter. So for those of you who are less convinced by gorgeous green bars than I am, I'm gonna show you what this looks like in living color. So I'm gonna show you two very quick before and after clips. I'll explain them a little bit. So the first one is a gentleman, he's a, an Australian man, in a mall in Alberta, Canada, talking about addiction. Don't let, I know it's kind of confusing, don't let that throw you, right? So I'm gonna ask him a question about addiction, I'm gonna talk to him about a frame, and then I'm gonna ask him the same question afterwards. So I want you to look for the differences between the before and after. The second clip, set of clips, is a woman from Birmingham, England, who's being asked about early childhood adversity, again, before, frame, and after. And I, I want you to, again, be, be on the lookout for the difference between the before and the after. And I will tell you that I have kind of cherry-picked these two examples such that they are noticeable. I'm setting the bar of noticeability for you all, kind of appropriately low for right after lunch. So just be on the lookout, difference before and after. If somebody is addicted to cigarettes, chose to have those first few drags and rip the shit out of their throat and become addicted to cigarettes. Alcohol, they chose to have enough alcohol to end up addicted to it. As I said initially, leading to addiction is the susceptibility to addiction. And if you aren't exposed to it, and especially at sensitive times or at cr critical times, then you might not end up addicted. So what do you think about stress? It's a normal part of development in my yeah. opinion. What's the effect or the role of stress? Again, thinking about, about young, young kids. That causes, in my opinion, long-term damage to um, a child. A lot of the emotional developments and the learnings that are meant to take place would, wouldn't happen in that situation. So did you all notice some differences between the, the befores and, and, the, and the afters? Yes. So if you don't work on addiction, the first one is a little bit hard to see but it's super important. So the gentleman goes from individual responsibility and choice to what those in the field would kind of call biological susceptibility, like that. So I've seen these clips well over 500 times, and I notice two things every time. So did anyone notice what the Australian man in the mall in Alberta said in his after clip? He said, as I said initially, he didn't, he didn't say that initially, right? But it feels like he did, because guess what? He's got more than one way to think about addiction. And what the frame has done is it's activated one of those ways of thinking, brought it to the forefront, and made that the lens 
through which he's thinking and talking subsequently. So the blonde woman from Birmingham, did anyone notice what she says in her before and her after? She says, in my opinion, and then she says, in my opinion. And they are both her opinions, but they are different. And the difference is that one of those opinions has been pulled to the front and the other has been pushed to the back. And that one that's pulled to the front becomes the way that she understands and interprets the issue. So now you've had this productive distance. We've done child mental health and addiction and early childhood. Now I'm gonna take that away. I'm gonna show you a little bit of what this looks like on your issue. Uh, and, and I'm gonna pull out just a small piece of the research, which you can find on our website. It's free and publicly available. And talk a little bit about this issue of, of how you talk about housing, specifically how you talk about the issue of race and equity within housing. So in this work, we took that as a, as a given, as a prerequisite, that folks in this field need to be able to have these conversations. And one of our central questions was, how do you have these conversations more effectively? How do you talk about issues of race and equity in the housing domain in a way that makes people see the issue as salient and that advances their support for a range of policies? So to address that question, we tested three different values frames so those are what you see in the upper right-hand corner of the screen. We tested the value of equal opportunity, of housing as a human right, and last but not least, the value of interdependence, that we are all connected and that the, the well-being and welfare of one influences that of, of all. So I'm gonna show you what this looks like. So these are various versions of like purple that you'll see these bars come in on. So when you test equal opportunity, you have what I would describe as kind of like meh, meh. Like not really strong effects, none of them are negative, one of them is statistically indistinguishable from zero, which is saying nothing, which is should not be your goal as communicators. So when you test the value of housing as a human right, you have kind of similarly meh effects, and one of these is even directionally negative. But interestingly, when you test the value of interdependence, again, these are ways of talking about race and equity, you see these large positive effects across a wide range of outcomes from issue salience to support for land and zoning regulations to home ownership policies. So the takeaway from this first part is that frames matter. The choices that you make, sometimes small ones, the pronouns that you use, do you say us and them? Do you say those people, those groups, or do you say we? The values that you choose have an incredible consequence in terms of what people think, feel, and are willing to do as a result of hearing your communications. And then my little soapbox as a researcher is to tell you that those are knowable questions. How should we frame our issues is not one that needs to be made around a small group of issue experts, deep issue experts on an issue, but rather ones that we can use research to answer and get a better idea of how to advance. The second reason why framing matters is unfortunately every single person in this room has a problem. And it is a problem of perception. And those of you who are in really explicit communications positions have probably found yourselves in this position before where you think you have the perfect way of talking about your issue. You try it out with two of your closest colleagues who are both deep housing experts and it is awesome. <laughs> like what could go wrong when it goes out to normal people? You get that little joke in there? Yeah. And you find that when that thing that was so awesome and resonant for you and your closest colleagues goes out to people who aren't you, one of two things happens. So first of all, it isn't. It doesn't resonate, it doesn't have grip, it doesn't land, it doesn't move. Second, and, and more unfortunately, is that thing that which sent you and your colleagues running in this direction towards this or that reform sends people that you're communicating with in the exact opposite direction. So again, I'm not gonna ask that you take my word for it, I'm gonna give you two very quick examples of what this looks like. The first of which, again, will allow you to have some of that productive, critical distance. And the second one, I'll take that away from you. 
So the first one, again, comes from work that we've done on early childhood, and you don't have to be an expert in this issue to know that those people who are talk extensively about the issue of stress, early adversity, and how it affects development. They say things like this. This is a direct quote. Persistent stress can derail development and have negative long-term effects on health and well-being. Again, this is a direct quote. I've just made one small change to it. In the original quote, negative was deleterious. But I've kind of made that change to be mildly less obnoxious and obvious in terms of the point that I'm about to make. So people who work in this field view this as true, like really truthity, true, true, all the way through true. But when this kind of a message goes out to people who are not experts in the field of early childhood, you get things that look and sound like this. Life's hard. It's supposed to be hard. You know, what, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. You know, the, all the bad cliches you can think of. I mean, there's, there's been people that have come from absolutely nothing to make it in whatever society's eyes deem success. So I realize that's a little hard to hear, so I'll just make it like crystal, super crystal clear. That which you just heard, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger, is not what the expert intended when he or she opened his or her mouth to deliver this message. So something's going on between the, the intention, the delivery of this message, and its perception and its actual effect. And I'm gonna leave that, I know y'all are on the edge of your seats, I'm gonna leave that as a mystery for one more, one more example here. So this one, again, we're gonna pull the productive distance away from you all, and we're gonna, we're gonna talk about housing. So people who work on housing, imagine that in this room, say things like this, that our homes, surprise, surprise, have powerful effects on our health and well-being. And what we need to do is make sure that everyone has access to quality, affordable, healthy housing. Sounds, yeah, someone's clapping. Like, yeah, you clearly say this, right? Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So when this goes out to people who aren't you, one direction that this goes in is things that look and sound like this. You know, if you're just messy, you obviously are gonna have bugs and rodents and stuff. Do you keep it up? More maintenance type deal. I take pride in whatever home that I live in. And can you do that and manage it yourself is more so than anything. I think good housing this is a definition that's for the person that's actually living there. So I think the person decides for themselves. It all depends on the, the person or persons that are being housed. So I think that's right to self-determination. Because everybody's perception is different. What may be good to me may not be good to somebody else. So good housing for somebody that lives in a infested apartment complex would be, oh, if it doesn't have vermits and roaches, that's good housing. So I don't know if you caught that last one. He said vermits. That's actually, it's not a, it's not a word. Uh, but you all know what he meant, and I don't mean to make fun of anybody in that video, but it's weird, right? Like what you heard, this relative assessment of deservingness, which I find like disgusting and disturbing, is not what this expert intended. It's not what you all intend when you say things like you see on the left. So I won't keep you on the edge of your seats for a moment longer. The thing that explains this lost in translation effect, this you say, they think phenomenon is culture. And when I say culture, I don't mean kind of Indiana Jones, external artifact, archeology span kind of culture, which is still what my parents think I do, <laughs> but rather culture in mind. Culture as a shared set of understandings, of patterns of reasoning, of ways that we have adopted to think about and make sense of, of how our world works and the people in it. And so my favorite quote about culture, unfortunately, does not come from an anthropologist, it comes from a former US president. So JFK, way back in 1962, at a commencement speech at Yale University, said that the great enemy of the truth is very often not the lie, deliberate, contrived, and dishonest, but the myth, persistent, persuasive, and unrealistic. So when we go back to that gentleman on the corner of Phoenix, Arizona, with his hat pulled down, talking about early childhood, it's not that he's out to get kids. It's not that he's thinking, what can we do to really mess him up, right? It is that he has an understanding of stress and adversity that gets in the way 
of him being able to interpret that information. So the takeaway here is that culture always invariably and forever complicates your job, complicates your work as communicators. And the argument is that part of what becoming an expert strategic communicator is about is actually becoming an expert in the culture that you are communicating into. So the third and final reason why framing matters is because I think everyone in this room is interested in sustained, meaningful change on issues of housing. And my argument is that if that is true, then you are essentially also interested in culture change. You have to be. And the reason you have to be, to use a quote from another former US president, is that, that, that culture and public thinking matter greatly in the work that you do. So Lincoln said that public sentiment is everything. With it, nothing can fail. Against it, nothing can succeed. Whoever molds public sentiment goes deeper than he who enacts statutes or pronounces judicial decisions. And so this quote guides the work that my organization, that the Frameworks Institute does. And our theory of change that guides our work is that if you can take a field of practice, the field of housing, and if you can inform that communications practice, again, based on careful research, and that people can share a message and move it out into the public discourse over time, right? You can actually change the information air that people breathe on an issue. You can change the way that people receive information and the frames in it when they open the newspaper, if anybody does that anymore, when they talk with friends and colleagues, you change that information ecology. And when you do that over time, you can actually in deep and powerful ways change the way that people think about an issue. And that matters in and of itself, but that matters also in an instrumental way because that fundamentally puts you in a different policy context that gives policymakers room to move and also not only room to move but pressure at their backs to have to move and do different things in their roles as policymakers. So we work with a lot of people who want to bypass this middle stuff, right? They wouldn't say it but they don't care about people. <laughs> So this is what's called a direct legislative strategy. You go right to the policymakers and you get them to change a policy. You flip some seats, you do whatever legislative change work does, and you try to get that done. My argument is that if that is all you ever do, you will always and forever be doing that. As new policymakers come in, as parties change, and that what matters greatly is building a foundation of public understanding underneath that policy making such that change that happens in a positive direction cannot be rolled back when other people come into office. So even people who, who get that this middle stuff matters frequently start in fields that look like this. Right, so in early childhood you've got people talking about kids' health, you've got learning people, you've got child protection, you've got parenting, you've got epigenetics and executive function, they're all telling different stories. So my question to you is, what do you think this, situ this situation, this scenario is likely to do in terms of culture change and moving the way that people think? Nothing. Worse than nothing, when people are confused, they don't stay confused. They go back and believe even more strongly in the ways that they do about the issues that you work on. So part of the work that I'm really excited about, which is what Tiffany's gonna, gonna talk about, is how do you as a group, as a room, people in this room, how do you move from this as a way of characterizing your communications, cacophony, to something that looks more like this? Not that everyone is saying the, three, the same three magic words because I hate to tell you there, there aren't three magic words, but rather you are advancing the same set of ideas every time you communicate and you are sharing and amplifying those ideas. So the idea here is to share frames and stories to amplify rather than to compete and splinter. And with my last 10 seconds, I'm gonna leave you with one of my favorite quotes which is from a, an Austrian philosopher named Ivan Illich, who says that neither revolution nor reformation could ultimately change a society, 
Rather, you must tell a more powerful tale, one so persuasive that it sweeps away the old myths and becomes the preferred story. And with that, I'm going to hand over to Tiffany and encourage you all as we leave to frame on. Can y'all feel the energy of this moment? D do you feel it? I don't know. I don't, I don't think y'all feeling it. I don't know. Do you feel the energy of this moment? I will say that for those of us who've been working in housing for a long time, we have come a very long way. When I first started working in this field, as probably many of you, just getting people present to the idea that affordable housing or just housing in general was something that we ought to pursue and invest in was a challenge. People didn't want to associate with what it meant to be investing in housing because it was a consumer good. It was a, something people made money on. That has changed, folks. This is our moment. So I want to say, it is our moment, but there is a lot of work to be done. Just because people have now, the sheer scale of what is happening across, not just California, but across this country, has changed, it does not mean that people automatically support the things that we know would help. Is that right? We actually have to pull them forward. And that is really tough to do for a lot of reasons. Some of that is framing, as we're going to talk about in a second. Some of that is people don't really understand how communities actually get developed. They don't even understand how housing actually gets developed. They don't get what we do, right? Some of that is happening because people are afraid. All over this country, for the first time, folks who I would say have never had to have a conversation about affordable housing are afraid of losing their homes, of not being able to stay in their neighborhoods and communities. They're afraid. And that makes the journey for us of pulling people forward, of building their sense of possibility, of building their efficacy, and their willingness to stand with us, sometimes tough to dress. But I'm here to tell you that there are ways to do that, and there are lots of opportunities, and I want to just make that so present and plain that we get it. I put that, that, that reel together in terms of the video to really get people present to the moment that we're in, because some folks talk about, we, we think we kind of have a moment. This is really our moment. How many of you remember 2008, right? When the world economy had collapsed because of what was happening in the American housing market, right? You saw the video reel. I mean, the world economy, stocks are down all over the world. I mean, it was crazy, right? And in the conversation, in that moment, the conversation, the narrative was all about banks too big to fail, the narrative was about subprime mortgages and TARP, and this is not to say that those things aren't important, right? Making sure that we're regulating our banking system, right, and that those functions are operating as they should is important. But the narrative, the core narrative about why housing is so important, why it is the thing that stabilizes not only just our lives but our communities was not the conversation folks were having. And so less than a decade later, we have found ourselves in a similar position, where every major housing market in this country is in crisis again. And this time, the conversation is about affordable housing. But I'm here to tell you that unless we pull folks forward to understand why this is central, beyond just their ability to afford that two-bedroom apartment or afford that new house they want, if it's not bigger than that, if we're not building a movement around something that's bigger and more important and more aspirational for our people, we're going to lose the moment. And that is why I'm here today. Because I think there's a real opportunity to do that, and I think there's a whole room full of people here that agree with me. Is that right? So, so here's the thing. Here's the first thing I want to say. Traditionally, one of the things that we, we tend, we've, had, we've had to fight in the past is these dominant narratives about affordable housing and what that means and who we're talking about when we say the words affordable housing or even when we talk about housing, people make assumptions about who we're talking about. For the first time in a long time, people who never thought they would be having a conversation about housing are having that conversation. I was doing some focus groups in Virginia where Amazon has just landed <laughs> and they're all getting nervous because you already got a housing market there too that is out of control. And I had a tax attorney say, hey, listen, I'm a tax attorney. 
I shouldn't be having these challenges. Wait a minute, wait. I'm a tax attorney, this is right, right? I was in Sonoma just this weekend, guy who graduated from USC and Yale as an architect saying, wait, 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 this is a problem because I don't have a place to live. I'm literally on the verge of being homeless. I got two degrees, I'm an architect. Folks who never, right, thought they would have to have the conversation are having the conversation, but it's our responsibility to pull them forward and make a case for what we need them to do. It's not a slam dunk unless we pull them all the way through. So I wanna talk a little bit about what that requires and what it means. So first of all, let's get really present. The work that I do is strategic case making, but I wanna be really thoughtful about narrative shift. Lots of folks are talking about narrative and what it's supposed to do and what it means and how we shift the conversation. What I want to say fundamentally is we think about there are a couple ways that people tend to shift the way that they talk, their, their, their attitudes and predispositions. We're going to talk a lot, I'm going to say a little bit about framing in just a second. But one way is personal experience. These folks who never thought they would have the experience of not having a place to live or being concerned about that, all of a sudden have that personal experience where you get doctors and lawyers and, and right, driving Uber right, just to make ends meet because they can't stay in the communities where right, they, they thought they would be able to afford forever and now they can't do so. That kind of personal experience. And for those of us who are affordable housers, many of us know this, know this well. That's the reason why many of us take our legislators on tours of affordable housing housing because we know it changes their perception when they have a personal experience with residents, for example, of folks who live in our, in our communities. The second one is a triggering event, when you've got something that, a disaster, whether it's a hurricane, a flood, something like that. When something like that happens, people change the narrative. All of a sudden, even in Sonoma and other parts, in Paradise and other parts of, the, um, of, of California, when the, the, when the floods came and when the wildfires came, people rallied around each other. We need to find a place for folks to live. And there was that kind of empathy and goodwill, right? The challenge of the triggering event, however, didn't last, all, didn't last a whole long time, right? But, but, it, but it is one way that people shift. A third way is social disruption, right? When something is happening in our environment that disrupts the way, fundamentally, that we think about the world. Let me give an example. How many of you, when you were little, your parents said to you, don't get in a car with strangers? Don't do that. Don't you dare get in a car with strangers. And yet every day, many of us get an Uber, Lyft, and everything else, right? Because the technology has disrupted our, our, our ways of thinking about what this world in front of us is supposed to do. And when that happens, the narrative can shift. And the other way that happens is when you and I are making a strategic case to those to pull them forward. And I will say to you that what all those things have in common is that they limit the social distance. It's easy when you don't feel like you're affected by something to talk about those people over there and what they need. It's harder when it's you. It's easy to talk about those people over there and what they don't have and what they deserve when you're facing a natural disaster. It's easier to talk about the over there, right, when you don't have some kind of technology disrupting your community or what you, what you have known to love. Our role, I think, is not to wait around for folks to get that personal experience or not to wait around for the next hurricane or other kinds of things. Those things will happen. Our role is to take the bull by the horns and to really make a strategic case for what it means to be investing and thinking about housing. And I will say to you, when I think about strategic case making, what it means to actually do that, there are three components, one of which my colleague Nat talked a lot about. A part of it is the way that you say it, right? Just the way that you show up and talk to folks makes a difference. There are ways in which you can start this conversation that just backfires, right? We know so much more about those backfires now, right? When you start a conversation talking about how much people are paying for their rent, a lot of that backfires, because they say, yeah, poor people are poor because they don't know how to make good choices with their money. Well, that's not what we're trying to know, <laughs> right? right? It can backfire on you, so being present and thoughtful about framing opens up the opportunity to have a different kind of conversation. And that's exactly what Nat was talking about. How you avoid the, the, the backfires of just the way that we're talking. So we gotta get that down. The second part is powerful storytelling. And I'm so, I have to say, you know, I work with a lot of folks across California and I'm so proud of y'all. <laughs> this is the part where I feel like y'all are hitting it out of the park. I look at some of the stuff like Residents United. I mean, y'all are hitting it out of the park. Y'all are hitting it out of the park. Y'all are doing it. Where you are bringing the stories of folks who understand what it means not to have resources, but how, what it means to right, have housing that, that helps you to thrive and what that looks like and to be empowered in terms of your own voice and talking about that. 
And I will tell you that even supercharging those stories, not just stories about what's happening to people, but also how systems are embedded in that, and even more important, this notion about how we all, right, should be thinking about housing is so important, it's so important. And let me just say the reason why that storytelling is important to keep doing it, keep doing it, keep doing it, is because it engages people at the level of emotion. It helps you avoid the challenges of right, people not having empathy when they hear those stories, right? And they hear how systems and, and are embedded in that and our strategies for overcoming that, people listen differently, right? They respond differently when they hear a story versus all of our fact sheets and all the data that we think we're gonna leverage to get people's support. And the last part on this is the call to action. Now this is the part where we're struggling a lot. We are struggling mightily with this sort of call to action and the value proposition, talking about the value of what we bring. Our, the, our value is not simply that we help people to afford the places where, li where they live. The value is we are literally, I would like to say, building the <laughs> load-bearing walls of civil discourse across folks who never thought they talked to each other in their community, who never thought they had interest with other folks of other economic and social circumstances in their communities. Our value is bigger than what we're talking about. And that is really important, not just the value of who we are, but what the solutions we propose. And I will tell you right now that if you don't get this last part right, if we don't get the case-making part right, it may not backfire. It may not lack in terms of empathy, but we don't get the support we need. This is what I call the, the backpack problem, right? You have this great story, you tell folks about it, you frame it right, right? And then they give you a backpack. And when I say backpack, what I'm talking about is backpacks are the, when you need systems change, we need to fundamentally transform the housing delivery system in this country to fundamentally change the way that we even deliver and also allocate resources to housing. That is fundamentally a systems problem. But when we don't lift up these issues and make a case for the specific things we're talking about, we get, eh, whatever, right? We get the small things. For example, in Paradise, you see all the disaster kind of issues. You know, Sergeant Kelly was talking about the last time there was a hurricane there. And literally, he said, as sophisticated as we are, my God, what we need is a, a serious disaster response system. And what we're working with, unfortunately, unfortunately are shovels and buckets. When we don't make a strong enough case for the work we're trying to do, whether it's tenant protections, right? Whether it is, whether it is um, a local ordinance, whether it is a housing, when we don't make the case for those specific things, we get the backpacks, we get the small increments of things. So I wanna talk about that. I have to say, I feel so strongly about this that I wrote a book about it. <laughs> to address these things that we are constantly battling and we don't even know it. The backfires, so it's called back, backfires, backpacks, and bedtime stories. We think that when we're having a conversation and making a case, often what's happening is all the way that we're taught is backfiring. Or we're getting these backpacks, these small little incremental things that, that don't fundamentally change what we're trying to do. Or we get those bedtime stories. People say, oh, well, you know, back in my day, this is the way we used to do it. How many of you heard that? Well, back in my day, people didn't need handouts, or people didn't, we didn't have to have all this stuff. And you're battling stuff that has nothing to do with you. As Nat was talking about, you're battling these myths that are old, that don't make any sense at all as a part of talking about case making. And I want to really bring this home. I was doing some work just recently in Sonoma, and, and it's, it's really interesting. Every single person, we talked to hundreds of folks there, every single person, one of the top things on their list for the first time that I can imagine, housing, affordable housing and homelessness. Every single person. Not one person said, no, we don't need it every single person. So this is no longer a conversation about bringing those folks forward. But when you start to talk to folks about what specifically it would mean to address those issues, then you get problems. We talk about tenants' rights and just cause evictions. Then all the landlords in the room stand up and they give you that example of that one tenant back in wherever, right? Uh-huh, that one tenant that, it, right? That's, you know, that one tenant that almost, right, that took them to court, et cetera. And I was talking about it, I said, you know, you all say you are in favor of affordable housing, where there was a measure in that, that recently would have given $124 million to a trust fund, and you voted that down. You didn't vote for it. What happened? And a large number of folks said, listen, I am struggling. I'm middle class. I, I, I care about this issue, but they're going to just take my taxes. It's going to go somewhere to some lobbyist somewhere, and I'm not going to benefit from that, right? Issues of accountability, issues of I don't see where my money's gonna go. And so they wanna support it. 
I said, well, there are a whole range of things we can do. But we can, all, all kinds of things we can do. The permitting, pro all kinds of things that are, are helpful. And every time you start to put those solutions on the table, whatever the folks are, whoever the folks are, who don't, who see that they might have to make some sacrifices in those solutions, those are the folks who show up. The challenge for us is pulling those folks forward because we recognize the case that we need to make to those folks at that moment. And it's challenging for us, but here's the good news. There's a lot of good social science about how to do that. Nat talked about a little bit of that, about how you actually bring people forward, about starting with why, because you understand that people start there, right? It's the, the way that people think about their own lives. If you don't start there, right, they don't see their connection. They don't see their stake in what you're trying to do, right? speaking powerfully to the aspirations of who people are. I'm going to give you an example out of my own personal life, and I hope they can be helpful in, in thinking about that as, a, as one just particular strategy. In fact, I'm going to go to what I consider to be part of the sort of 10 sort of core components of that, that we before why, which is really important. If you don't start with that why first, people don't see their stake in your success. I have a 10-year-old son. He comes to me one day and he says, Mom, I need $10, I want to go skating. And I said, no, I don't, listen, I'm not doing that. <laughs> I know, because I know exactly what's going to happen. Some of you have kids, you know, they take the $10, they go skating, they eat all the junk food and, right? Two weeks later, he comes to me, he says, mom, I, <laughs> I clean my room, I clean up the garage, I got an A on that math test, I was, I was really still in church on Sunday. I really was, but you know it. I was, in, I was really still in church. I didn't fidget around or anything, right? I even washed the dishes. I've been really good. So I know, you know I'm going skating. Can I have $10? Now, my reaction usually is to say no. And the reason I usually say no is because, again, I know what happens. They go skating. I don't mind them going skating, but what happens is they buy $10 of junk food and candy. And then he comes up and he's <laughs> amped up on the sugar. And then for the next three hours, your kid is bouncing up it, right? And, you're, and so I used to say no. But in that moment, I could not say no. I could not do that because my son spoke to me and the aspiration of who I am. When he said those things about who I am, right, about, who, about what he had done, what he was communicating to me was, you're a good mom. I did my homework. <laughs> right? I washed the dishes. Right? I, 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 I did the stuff I was supposed to do with dad in the garage. I even sat in church, man. Right? And what I got out of that was a sense of who I am, right? And that changed my disposition, right? He was speaking to the aspiration of who I want to be. I'll give you another example. Some of you, this is time, this is the top of the year where people are exercising and they're getting all excited about exercising. Some of those, some of you may have seen those Peloton commercials, some of these other exercise commercials. They don't start the commercial by saying, you're fat. <laughs> and if you don't hurry up and do some exercise on our machine, it's going to have all kind of health consequences. You're going to gain weight. You're going to have to go to the doctor. And da -da 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 -da. Right? That's what a lot of our messaging sounds like. Oh my god, the sky is falling in. Da -da -da -da. Right? Oh, right? All this sort of negative stuff that happens up front. Right? That's what it sounds like. Instead, what the Peloton, you've seen those commercials. The guy, he's on the machine, and he's going, he's ripped, got his stomach of eight-pack or six-pack. He's barely breaking a sweat. Then he gets off, and the woman gets on, and she's getting it. She's got her hair all done. She's got makeup on. I don't know how she did it, but she got makeup on. Her hair is blowing in the wind and stuff. And you look at that, and you're like, whoo. And you call that 1-800 number. You got to get that machine. You're like, I got to get this thing. Now, I will say, you buy the machine, it, it goes down in the basement, and there's, it, you know, clothes are now hanging on it, but we won't talk about that. You don't use it, but that's another story. But the important part about case making is listening in, to the aspirations of the people you're talking to. So when we're doing our work across California, we're listening to who you want to be. In LA, who you want to be? Sonoma, Sonoma County, right? A part of what I'm constantly doing when I work with folks is listening for who you want to be. I work all over this country asking folks that question and listening and then pushing that back at folks. Because that's when people open up and they're willing to begin having a conversation with you that may be tough, that may be about racial equity, that may be about taxes. Yes, people, <laughs> you might have to pay some additional taxes. 
But do you get that the ask is different when I feel like the result of that is living into the aspiration of who I want to be, and you get that aspiration. Now that's not the only one of those core principles I'd say again, my sort of practice is around how you do that, and I even wrote a, a little bit of a pocketbook and a field guide, but the importance for us in this moment is not just the framing, it's not just the storytelling, it is fundamentally listening to folks on the other side of it and making a case to the people who are in front of us, recognizing that when we live into their aspirations, they help us live into the broader aspirations for our communities and for the state. Now, I want to take a moment here because this is, the theme of this conference is the future, and I want to say there is a perfect storm that is brewing, and it is in our favor. I like that. Ow! Yeah. There is a perfect, I mean, well, listen, I mean, literally, not only is this our moment, but there is a perfect storm that's brewing for us now and in the future that if we live into that offers up the, the opportunity to make an even stronger case than we've been able to make before. And I want to spell that out and I want to do that in a little bit of a way that I think Californians would appreciate out here in the tech valley, right? <laughs> out here in tech land. So first of all, the techno technological innovation, I know y'all get this, I'm not gonna talk about Silicon Valley, I'm not, but I am gonna talk about the implications of technology on helping us refocus on our homes, prioritizing it in a very different way. Now some of y'all, I think, remember, I, I will say this, I, I, I sometimes make my children laugh when, I, when, they, when we think about things that are, they would say are old and they don't know how to do things like a rotary phone. Ever had that play that game where you ask your kids to use a rotary phone and they have no idea what to do with that thing? Or your older kids write a check. At least they have no idea how to write a check. Cause right, it's like, what do you do that for, right? Well, I want to I want to sort of play a little game with you. Once upon a time, there were these things, and I, those things were called workplaces, where people used to actually get up out of their get up in the morning. They would go to. I don't, know, <laughs> I don't know if you know this, but there is a trend of moving folks not to a workplace, but having people work from home. Not simply because they get more productivity out of you when you work from home, that is true, but it's also because the business model works. If folks can make you work at home, right, or push you right to work at home, that means they don't have to pay for the commercial real estate space of housing all these workers during the time from nine to five. And across the nation, we're seeing more of that kind of work happen. So our children will be asking us right later, what, go, go to work, what, what does that mean? Right, because increasingly the work that we do will be done in our homes. Once upon a time, there were these things called like um, primary care physicians, and you'd go into like their offices, and you would talk to them and things like that. You would do that there. I don't know if you're looking at the healthcare these days, but more and more of that healthcare is being pushed to our homes. The model of the future for most healthcare insurers in this country is delivering as much healthcare as they can to you in your home. But here's the catch: you got to have one, right? Right? Here's the catch: you got to have one. Right? And so here's the thing for us, their business model is dependent on the work that we do, right? Once upon a time, there were these things called schools and colleges and universities that people would go out to, right? How many folks, you know folks who are on, you know, University of Phoenix or Strayer and all of that, right? Or how many folks are getting their, their real estate agents, getting their community, their continuing education credits at home, not in a right space? The, the model of the future of education is in our homes, right? Not just at the college level, but increasingly homeschooling. It is what it is. So if education is gonna increasingly be delivered in our homes, you gotta have a what? You gotta have one, right? You gotta have one. Increasingly, I would also say, once upon a time, there were these things called grocery stores and big box stores, where people used to go out and get stuff. They had like Toys R Us and Kohl's and Sears. One by one, those big box stores are disappearing, right? And all of that, including groceries, I would say, especially for rural areas, this is a really big issue for grocery stores, right? When they used to deliver groceries to your home. I will say for me, I have not had groceries, I have not gone to a grocery store in very many years because I've had groceries delivered. That is the movement of the future. This is Amazon, the new delivery drones. Right? In every major market of the country. And this is not 2015 or 20. This is today. Right? That more of that will be delivered to your home. Even groceries. Grocery stores closing down, especially in rural areas, because of how much traffic is now being driven to Amazon. And it is a, and it is a national travesty. It's, it's a shame, actually. But I will say, if more of that is coming to your home, guess what? You got to have a what? You got to have one. 
And I would say, even in terms of the way we think about this work, the autonomous vehicles, I know in DC, the autonomous vehicles, right? <laughs> Uber is piloting those in a number of different ways. And not only that, just that, but just even things like pizza delivery. I want to show a little video on social media because I think it illustrates how near and dear this issue is now. So we just ordered Domino's. This is the self-driving car that everyone kind of gave me some trouble about a couple weeks back saying, you should have recorded it. But uh, yes, we're going to record it tonight. Johnny's going to grab the pizza, this cool little car. But yeah, he should be here in a second. And here comes our car. It's kind of neat because it goes, uh, supposedly goes the speed limit of the community. We shall see. Um, it's one of the only cars that stops at this stop sign right here. Yep, this is it. So uh, Johnny has texted a code to kind of uh, get the pizza out of here, which we love. So here's uh, it turning in. Oh, it gets so scary. But uh, it pulls up. Johnny just um, pulls up the iPad, punches in his code. Yes! You got it. And so the he gets his pizza. Wave container is open. You can safely remove your order now. Pretty cool. There we go. Yes. You can safely remove it. Yay. Pretty cool. <laughs> awesome job, That's Domino's. Domino's self-driving delivery vehicle. And they say thank you. Please stand clear. We're closing up and taking off. <laughs> awesome job. It's hilarious. Sweet. Have a good time. So if more of those kinds of services are delivering directly to our home, you got to have one, right? Helping us to prioritize these issues, and I would say even in terms of the way that we build our homes is going to radically change. I can't tell you the time, even all across California, I can't tell you when I'm sitting down with residents all across the country, how many times I've heard the word tiny homes that has galvanized people's imagination, just build a tiny home, tiny home. I'm not sure that's the answer, but I'm saying that that technology, tiny homes, the 3D printing home, is going to change and transform. What I would say to you is the way that we prioritize what our homes mean. If your home is the source of how you get your education, or education is delivered. If your home is the source of your health care, right, is the, if your home is the place that you work, if the home is the place where all the things that you need are delivered to you, then what that means, right, our homes become so much more, right, than simply how much we can pay for it and where it is listed and what it, and all of that. So I want to say a couple other things about the storm that is happening, the sort of demographic shifts that are happening that are going to make it, I think, better or easier for us to make a case. One is, some, you know, the graying of America. Millions of Americans are coming out of the workforce. Not only do they need senior care, but they're also in houses that many of them cannot, for a variety of reasons, maintain. Yet they have no place to go. In a lot of parts of California, they, they got a great house. But the senior care and the upkeep of those houses are going to require so much more than they have. How are we going to deal with that? In addition to that, the automation. Senior social, I would say, if we think about social security, relies on the fact that we are providing resources, the, the current workforce, to the older workforce, so the folks who are retiring. And I got to tell you, if you look at any estimation of automation, in fact, Governor Newsom did a fantastic job. He was talking at, I think, USC or Stanford just a couple of weeks ago and talked about automation and what it means for California. If you haven't looked at it, you ought to go on YouTube and watch it where he talks about what this is, what this is about to do fundamentally to California, which is on the forefront of this. They're not enough, they're, they're, right? In all of that automation, you just saw the job, where are the jobs coming from? Who's going to support that, right? If we think about what that means for social, it's insolvent. Which here's why this is important for us. It's important for us because a lot of the folks that right now we're working, our work, right, centers around, are not going to have an income that will support their ability to maintain a home, whether they're homeowners or whether they are renters. So a lot of our models, which are based on all kinds of levels of income, 80% of AMI, 120% of AMI, they're not going to have an income. Whole swaths of our population will not have an income. We're going to have to think about that together. What does that mean when you've got whole swaths of the American population that does not have an income for which they can buy or purchase a rental unit or buy a home? And the third trend, the browning of America, you've got large numbers of people of color in this country who are literally locked out of the housing market with the wealth, racial wealth gap so wide that it is challenging. The opportunity for us is to begin having a conversation as these trends take form. How do we understand housing and how do we ensure the right of everybody across our community to have one? 
Now here's what gets me excited, I'll tell you the other thing that's happening. Somebody, somebody said, <laughs> the, 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 the saying used to be, the revolution will not be televised. Today, the, the revolution will be tweeted. <laughs> But I will say that it is incumbent upon us, and I say our communities are rising in their sophistication. And it's not just the young folks. I tell you, for those of us who figured out Twitter and, and Facebook and all the ways that new ways of organizing people, that is where we, as community organizers and housing, that is where we thrive. A lot of folks in this audience, how many folks in this, and let me just say it just by a show of, how many folks in this audience got their start community organizing? Let me just by a show of hands, how many people started there? Okay, we're gonna have to recruit some more in California. <laughs> For those of you who got your start in community organizing, we're about to go back there. We have to, right? But also, this offers up new opportunities for us in terms of the ways that we can get around the traditional media that often does not tell a narrative that is thoughtful for the work that we do. This is our opportunity to engage folks differently and to mobilize them differently than we've ever done before and access community power in a different way. And I'm excited to be able to do that with you. So let me just say, I think it's not just that the moment is now. When we think about the, the, the theme of this conference, this is about the future we're creating together. And those trends, if you look at those fundamentally, the way technology is going to reprioritize what happens in our homes, the way those demographic shifts are going to put front and center right, who actually gets housed and how those, those houses and those homes are paid for, right, how we fund that fundamentally, right, when you think about that and you put that together, that's a new opportunity to engage folks in a different way and make a case to people who, again, never thought they'd be having this conversation. So what I want to say to you, and I hope that you, again, feel the possibility of this moment, is that we are fundamentally at an, a time where the opportunity to do this is endless, but we got to be thoughtful about how we're pulling people forward, that every single thing that we do, not just how do we get the framing right, not just how do we tell the story, but how are we fundamentally making a case for the things that we know matter. So I'm going to say, for, for, for those of you who are, <laughs> again, thinking about how we build support for the work that we do, here's what's critical. We know great leaders have always understood public will building. We've always understood, I hope that we get, that you cannot simply just raise your voice and yell loud enough for folks to come to the table. We also know the importance of timing. This is our timing. Even if you got a great solution, if the timing is not right, it doesn't matter. This moment right here, it is urgent. This is our time. And for the first time in a long time, we know so much more about how to do this work. We know so much more about how to engage folks. And so what I want to leave you with is simply this. Listen, I got a whole lot of things I'd love to share with you online and talk to you about this and, and things that I do. But what's bigger than that, again, is our opportunity to make the case. And it is my hope, and really, sincerely, I think, my aspiration for you is that you come out swinging. This is not a time to be silent. This is not a time to be timid. This is not a time to feel fear failure. This is a time to, to, to fear five years from now being in the same position that we are today. I want everybody, if you can, to stand up. Stand up. And I know because y'all have been sitting so long. And I want you to say on the count of three, this is our moment. One. Y'all are ready. Woo! All right, okay. I want you to say it again, but louder. I want to give it to a country. One, two, three. This is our moment. Yes. Listen, I feel the energy of that, and I hope you do too. Have a great conference. Who's ready? Everyone, I hope. So if you are like me, and during those, how many of you guys, as you were listening, you were like, I would love to be Nat and Dr. T's best friend. <laughs> and you're already looking for their Twitter handles, their Instagram, you're planning that direct message that you're trying to get to them with. Um, I want to give you a couple tips on that for your sake and theirs. Two ways where you can immediately have the conversation with them now and not wait to that one, we will be having a Q&A for all the questions that you had while you're listening. Room 301, which I think is this way, 
uh, we'll be having a question and answer session. So please come with your questions. If you are not able to, a second place, you'd be able to read more about it. Dr. T's book that she mentioned to you before um, is on sale and you can get it there. There's also a book signing and reception that she's having tonight where you can also talk to her about it. The Frameworks Institute also publishes its toolkits and a lot of the papers that it has online where you can also learn from. Collaborations that they've done with Enterprise and other places like that where Dr. T also worked to learn about that. It's something where you can also find it online. Last couple of things, Wi-Fi. Hopefully you have the code on the back of your lanyard. Look at that and use that to tweet along with the conference. The hashtag is housingCA, so please tweet along with that so that people can follow it. Finally, there is an app that you can find, Housing California Conference app, where you can rate how the sessions are to give feedback. The answer is five stars for this session. That's the answer for <laughs> what you would give to that. So please stay tuned. This was Shaping the Future Part 1. So any questions you still have about the future will be answered tomorrow at lunchtime. Thank you all for coming. We'll see you soon. <laughs>